It's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, Cat Herder, and the creator of the forum, and I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific subject uh, with a very powerful message, and I'm really glad I've got a chance to discuss it. Now, I'd like to introduce this week's guest. Uh, Adam Fenderson uh, is a filmmaker. He and his wife have been making documentaries, uh, and they're very, very powerful films. But what I'd like to bring him on stage for is to address his new work he and his wife have produced called Unlikely You. Uh, this is a documentary about some college students who tried to succeed at college and failed and then are trying again and are wrestling with universities and colleges to succeed. Um, Adam, welcome to the forum. Thank you for having me. Well, grateful to see you, really grateful to see you. Um, we, we introduce people and from all walks of life, we've introduced sitting politicians, uh, we've introduced college presidents, journalists, um, and the best question we have in order to get people to introduce themselves is to ask them, what are you gonna be working on for the next year? What's going to be taking up most of your time? Um, well, right now, so my wife and I, like you said, uh, are filmmakers. And so we, what's taking up all our time right now is a new documentary that we're working on. Oh. Uh, but this is not about education. This is a little different from what we've done before. It's about small businesses in America. Oh. Uh, so that's taking up all our time up through basically, um, let's see, like through October. Um, but then uh, after that, we're going to go back to Unlikely. So Unlikely is is uh, the documentary that we, we premiered it at the Napa Valley Film Festival last year. Um, and we've done hundreds of screenings across the country where they're, they're all uh, grassroots screenings is what we call them. And so there people are um, ordering the film to come out and show it at their university or at their school. We've done a few red carpet premieres, um, but now we are building up to the theatrical release of the film, which is really cool. So we have, Wow. A, um, uh, a new cut. We've cut the film down to changed it slightly from what we, what it was in the past and um, added some stuff, taken some stuff away. And now we have a theatrical cut that we basically finished and are the, uh, it's going to be in theaters in three, in, in New York, LA, and DC. And then we're also now looking at uh, a few other theaters and we're going to be doing um, a run in theaters in late September or early October. And so wow. stay tuned for the exact dates or when it's coming out, but that's uh, that's what's going on right now. And then uh, quickly after that, within you know a few months after that, we're gonna be releasing on some sort of streaming platform, Netflix, yeah. Hulu, uh, Amazon, iTunes, that type of thing. So uh, that's all coming up. And then we're working with the foundations that helped us fund the film, um, along with some new foundations to uh, create a policy um, version, so some some clips from the film that we could create for policy events, um, so that we can use the film and the issues that we bring up in the film uh, to drive conversation for the 2020 election um, about the importance of student success in higher education. Fantastic! What a terrific agenda. Uh, first of all, as a small business creator and owner, I'd love to hear about this new documentary too. <laughs> as a small business ourselves, it's a, it's it's a fun. Yeah. It's a fun. It's yeah, weird in your heart. Yeah, but um, but congratulations on on the success of uh, of Unlikely. Um, Thank you. I'm in the D.C. area, so let me know when the uh, D.C. showing is there, so uh, I can bring uh, as many of my students to it as possible. Yeah, we absolutely will. Yeah, it, um, we're going to be hopefully having a, at least one week run in one of the in one of the theaters in, in the downtown area. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to um, show people um, a clip from the trailer. Uh, okay. to give a chance. So, if you haven't had a chance to see this yet. Uh, let me just play this. Anybody who's been educated knows you have to get a college that's degree because that's how you can take care of your family. Why would I not, Why would I not graduate in four years? Four years is the norm. I didn't have any resources at school. They didn't have counselors or anything like that. $10,000 for two semesters. The fact is only 50% of, of those who start college actually graduate. Most universities are doing, Most universities are doing a terrible and job and students are the ones paying the price. Students. They're bringing they're in students. Them with they're leaving them with an incredible the amount of debt. The easy explanation for why these students aren't graduating is, you know, they're poor. You, know, they're you poor. can't just you educate the up with 5% of the population. That's a problem. It's perpetuating inequality. And when our parents are compared to other industrialized countries, 
be in it's last. Like world. It's like the world. Like a fool. Like a fool. Like a fool. In America, we have a one-size-fits-all system. Either prosper or fall through the cracks. I quit my job to go, back, my job to to go back to my school. Parents came for my parents life. came I really for a better life. Them I really want to make them proud of me. I have to do this. I'm I gonna have work to do this. School. I'm going to work at school. At the end of the day, you need to, to, the you need to get that piece of paper. Everyone. The Every opportunity to get education. Whatever you're dreaming about, that dream can about, that dream can come around. Any university can redesign themselves around So we have to start a movement. So we have to start a movement. Because let me tell you, getting education right, let me tell you, getting education right is the single most important thing we can do in America today. Period. Well, who's ready to graduate? Well, who's ready to graduate? And we'll rise! For the first time in my life, I was excited about school. These different buttons. Only get it. What a powerful, moving trailer! Um, hey, uh, so I, friends, the way if you're new to the forum, the way this works is I start by asking our our poor guest a couple of questions of mine, and then what happens is all of you chime in with a torrent of questions of your own. Um, so I just want to get the ball rolling and ask a couple myself, and then please, I'd love to hear from you all. Remember, if you're new to this or if you haven't been here for a bit, remember on the white strip, there's different buttons. So press the raised hand if you uh, want to give us a text question, or press the, or if you want to give, join us on stage, or click the question mark if you want to give us a text question. Uh, so I, I got to begin by asking Adam, what led you and your wife to this particular topic? What, what interested you enough to spend so much time on uh, making a, a film about it? So my wife uh, is, her name's Jay, and she we are co-directors on all the things that we've done. And she was a college admissions officer at Columbia University. I actually think I saw somebody here from Columbia. Um, so hi. Uh, so she was uh, a college admissions officer, and she read applications and realized very quickly that it was, it, it was really only low income, or I mean, it was really, geared towards higher income students um, and that she watched as a lot of low income students like herself, she was a low income student, um, were turned away. And so she left admissions because she really wanted to work in film and television. And our first documentary was called First Generation, mm -hmm. where we followed four low income students who were trying to be first in their families to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, we really wanted to understand the challenges of low income students and see you know, how they the, the, the competition to get into college and what it takes to get there um, is really geared toward the wealthy. And so we, we wanted to kind of look at the other side of that. Um, and then once we, that film came out um, and we did a bunch of screenings and um, got some sponsorships and, and did some cool stuff with it. And then after that, we realized that people were saying, what's your next documentary? You should look at uh, completion. Um, not, it's not just about getting to college, it's about getting through college. Yeah. And originally we were like, no, we're done with doing education documentaries. But then when we learned that less than 50% of the students that start college actually graduate, we we were just blown away. And we're like, What's yeah. going on? It's, you can't, it can't just be the students aren't prepared um, or the students aren't, you know, smart enough um there's got to be something else to this and so we started investigating it and that kind of drove us into this direction of saying there's a big issue in higher education where it comes to the institutions that are not serving the students the student population that we have today they're just not serving them in, in the ways to help them be successful and so um, that's kind of what we uncovered as we were as we were filming this and we wanted to look at the schools that were doing a good job at kind of reinventing that um and and how to serve today's students and then also you know kind of investigate some of the problems that these students are facing that today's student is facing because i think one of the big things that we hope people get out of the film is that today's student is not what we typically think of as a college student um it's not a 18 to 25 year old it is not it is 
much older, um, different type of population than it has been in the past. Um, and in, in the past, I, when we talk about traditional students, we're really talking about, you know, 40 years ago, not, you know, 10 years ago. And so uh, for years now, it's been a different type of student. And we believe that institutions have been slow to catch up on that and really help those students be successful. Well, that's a, that's a powerful narrative for this. Uh, that completion rate is horrendous. Um, and, uh, and it's a kind of a known, a known effect within higher education, but not so much beyond. And you're absolutely right about the uh, uh, change of uh, the population. We normally don't think about this, uh, but the, um, there's still the idea of the typical college student is um, 18 years old, coming from a prep school, perhaps, so going, um, and the, you know, something like 38 to 40 percent of students are now adults. Um, yep. A, a very, very different, different world. And before I can further um, this line of thought, uh, we have a question from uh, Kelly Walsh a long-time friend of the program and a wonderful CIO in upstate New York. How's it going, Kelly? Good, good. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, Adam, uh, nice to meet you. And uh, as someone who works in an institution where uh, over half of our students are the first in their families to go to school, um, a lot of uh, you know low-income, non-traditional students, and we've been very successful. Uh, in fact, the uh, Brookings Institute did a report that showed that we were one of the most successful institutions in the region at improving students' financial mobility. So this topic yeah, you is very guys, You guys, Raj Chetty's uh, put, you, put, put you guys pretty much up there. I know, I know about that, yeah. That's oh, great. yeah, great, yeah. So uh, this is, topic is uh, near and dear to me. Um, so I'm curious that, you know, in the, in through doing the documentary and, and having all this exposure that you've had, you know, what kind of factors, if any, stood out when it comes to how did these students manage to kind of turn turn it around and go from, from struggling to succeeding? You know, was it about certain teachers, certain instrument, uh, you know, institutional practices? Um, you know, just, you know, it, was it, did it come down to them? And what they did. Um, what were your experiences with that? I think what, what we were what we were looking at specifically were the institutional um, changes, and so mm -hmm. the way that the institutions really shifted the way that they think about which students they're helping, how they're helping them. Um, it's you know we we really shifted away from getting into college, which we talk a little bit about, um, and how it's um, how it is. You know, really driven for the elite and for the wealthy, um, especially some of the top tier schools that have these amazing graduation rates. Places mm -hmm. like Columbia, where my wife worked, um, it is, and the, she narrates the film from her point of view. Uh, and so, there's great graduation rates in certain places, but uh, the majority of those schools are really catered to the wealthy. And so, these other schools that, um, frankly, a lot of them are trying to be these same upper echelon schools. When we have state schools like um, even, uh, you, you know, these big state universities that are trying to move up in the U.S. world and, you know, in the U.S. News and World Report rankings, and they want to be like these top tier schools, it really doesn't serve the public. Yep. Um, so yep. we see these low graduation rates. And so we need to, we looked at these schools and said, hey, which ones are doing a good job? And it really is an institutional change that we see. Uh, the shifts that certain schools are taking to focus on which um, to focus on the students that they have and to open the doors to more students. Um, one of the big success stories that we, we look at in the film is Georgia State, which I'm sure a lot of uh, educators are aware that they're, they're kind of making waves in some of the, some of the work that they've done. Um, but we look at the way that they are targeting students, following students, making sure that these students have support. Um, we are also looking at some of um, some other schools that have different uh, different ways of, of educating students so we have um we look at a competency-based program and how that is that we believe that competency-based education can be absolutely excellent and that if we can focus on that um we can turn it into something that would be not just supportive to uh the students but also help the school scale um to a larger amount now they're Graduation rates are tough on those because it's it's a it's a it's a newer system, mm -hmm. um, but we do think that there's ways to like pull people back in that have finished um, and and help them get a degree at a lower cost um, and that is a quality degree and I, and I think that that's one of the tough things that everybody talked about is like what's a quality degree, but um, I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of opportunities out there that universities and uh, college systems can take advantage of um, to to actually support the student. So of course, every student 
needs to put their own effort into it. So yes, we need to look at what the students are doing as well. Yeah. But if we stand back and just say, well, the reason why they're not being successful is because they're not working hard enough. Um, and 50% of the students just aren't working hard enough, apparently, that's just not true. Like we, it's economically and, and you know, socially, we need to make sure that we have more students with some sort of post-secondary degree. It's not just, you know, feel good, let's help out these students. Like we need to do this economically to stay competitive. So if we don't shift and if the university systems don't shift to make sure that these students are being successful, then we're missing out. Excellent. Uh, Kelly, before you go, uh, is there anything that you and your institution do that you would add to this that's uh, successful? Uh, sure. Uh, in fact, a lot of what Adam said rang true right away with with us. So, we, you know, we're a career, uh, you know, a career school, uh, essentially, although we've become more traditional in many ways, but not in changing how we support student success. So um, we have uh, so many resources in place, success coaches, um, you know, a huge focus on retention, uh, you know, everything we can do to, you know, uh, as Adam was talking about, to pay attention, you know, have an eye on who's struggling, why are they struggling, what can we do to give them support, um, you know, tutoring and the learning center and just so many resources we have and making sure that they're aware of them and that we're being very proactive about going out of our way to say, hey, what are the challenges you're facing? What can we do to help you overcome them? Um, as well as paying attention to financial, because that's one of the big reasons a lot of times students leave they're just you know they have life situations and changes that cause them struggles there so what can we do to be flexible to help them get through those things I had a, that's wonderful and uh, I think uh, Kelly we may need to bring you back um, or have a session on your campus to talk about that sure um, Raj Chetty's not an easy person to impress um, <laughs> if, uh, let me let me come back to something that came up in the trailer um, and uh, and I, I think this also also come up a year ago in the forum when we had Sarah Goldergrab as a, as a guest. Um, you know, we do ever since the 1960s. We've had this pretty elaborate system of financial aid, everything from federal aid to state aid to institutional aid. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, it's very extensive. It can be quite bureaucratic. Why is that failing? I mean, how come? How come? What's wrong with that system right now? Sarah Goldergrab is going to be the one that's going to tell you all about why it's failing. <laughs> um, she, uh, yeah, she's a force out there. Um, I, I would not be able to specifically say why it's failing. I think that there are lots of there are lots of things that are that are that the financial aid system is, is struggling with. Um, yeah. I believe that the you know universities the price has obviously gone up so high exactly. in the same way, and so we're we're running into a lot of these issues where the the price it's just it's just pricing people out. Um, but I do know that there are also there are also a lot of opportunities that students don't know about, and I think that that's a big issue. And and this has been an issue that we've been looking at for years now. Where it's like it's amazing to me that students have this idea, this assumption of how much things cost, uh, that they don't realize that there are opportunities out there, that there are other options. Um, and and every school will tell you we've got this and we've got this and we've got this way and this way and this way and this way to help it but i don't think the students know that i don't think the information gets down to the students at the same level that it should um but, and that's from getting in all the way to graduation and so i think that there are a lot of issues that that the financial aid system needs to look at um and there's federal level there's state level and there's institution level um, and I think federal and you know, obviously people are talking about it at the federal level, that's all over the, the news right now. Um, but I think that at the institution level, it's going to be a, an individualized system. So each yeah. institution really needs to look at what they're doing, what, what they can do to help. Um, at the state level, you know, it's like, can we allocate more funds to the institutions? How do we do that? Um, does there need to be some sort of accountability um, to who gets the funds? I mean, there are so many questions about how to make sure that the schools are getting the right funding and that the funding is getting down to the students. It's an incredibly complicated system. So I'm, I know that Sarah is way better at this than I am. Um, well, you. And, and she was a passionate guest and I, I, I wanted to hear what, what you had learned. So thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a terrific answer. Uh, uh, and Kelly, thank you again. Um, thank you again for being here. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Um, please join us for more questions uh, before the hour is out. 
uh, we had a question from Jason um, at Columbia, actually, um, and uh, he uh, wanted to know more about the storytelling side of things. Uh, this is a, you know, the, making this film was quite a challenge. It's not a visual topic per se. How did you, how did you turn college success into a compelling narrative and video form? Uh, that's a, that's a tough thing to do. So we, uh, I think that at the heart of every story is the characters, right? So there are um, there's so much information that we wanted to get across that uh, we we have a, we interviewed so many experts, um, and so we have a lot of the a lot of the stuff that's in the film is going to be the experts talking, as well as we created some animation um, with some characters that kind of. Uh, help us tell these, help us explain these details in a um, in an understandable way. Um, so there's experts and there's narration and there's and there's animation that kind of gets the information across. Um, but at the heart of every story are the the characters, and so we followed five characters or five students um, through their their everyday life and we see the struggles that they go through. Um, and hopefully that is what, uh, you know, people, people watch the film and, and you may remember this stat or that stat, but what we really want you to do is connect to the characters, um, and understand them and feel, um, feel like you can understand their struggles and what they're going through. Um, and then that, that's what makes any story compelling in our, in our opinion. So, um, there's plenty of movies out there that are just talking heads. Um, but if you don't, if you don't get to know the people behind it, um, and the people that are actually affected by this and see their lives and in the film, you meet them and their family and their children and the school that they're going to. And, and you really see the struggles that they are facing, um, as well as their successes. And so you can cheer for them and you can, and you can, you know, cry with them as well. We have we have more questions coming in, and let me bring a few folks up on the stage. Um, and friends, so you see how easy it is to join us uh, up here on stage, and also to ask questions by text. So please fire them off. Uh, this is a rich subject. I'm going to add a little thing here. Um, you should see a little teal colored box on the screen. Uh, if you click that, you should be able to join us up here on stage. Um, and we have a longtime um, uh, friend of the program, Tom Riley, who uh, has a question. Uh, hi, Tom. Hello. Basically, I'm working uh, our climate crisis, and it's now very clear that uh, during the work to, uh, life of the people we're training, uh, we will either achieve, we will achieve some uh, uh, stabilized human society that fits the planet, uh, and there's just a question of how many people are going to be alive for it between 1 billion and 6 billion. Wow. So, the que but, and this is one of the most dramatic things that's happened in human history. And we just are not presenting it to our people, to our young people. We're not talking about it. And uh, I've been trying to do so, wrote a bunch of short stories. Then we wrote a uh, screenplay. And the question is, what can we do with the screenplay? How do you move it forward? It seems to be your area of expertise. That's a good question, Tom. Making a movie about any topic is one of the most difficult things in the world. I mean, there are so many. We actually just took over these offices from somebody that was working on a climate change documentary. So there are huh. multiple documentaries coming out there about climate change. Um, for us, every time we are making a film, uh, financing comes from different places. Um, the film that we're working on right now is uh is financed by a corporation um and the film that our last film was financed yeah you know, unlikely was filmed financed completely by foundations so first step if you want to get something made is to find the people that care about it obviously you're passionate about it but find the people that care about it that have a bunch of money <laughs> and then ask them for the money put something together put together funds or organizations or corporations and and finding the the cash flow um and then that and that is always the hardest thing and once you can get once you get the money to get it going um then you can you can start moving forward usually it's piecemeal you do a little bit there it took us a long time to make this last documentary it took us 
seven years to make our first one. It took us about five years to make this last one. So it is a it is a long process. And with climate change, I, you're right. We don't have that much time. So uh, you gotta you gotta find the money fast. But I would also encourage you to go out and find the documentaries that are out there that you really enjoy. Um, there's lots of stories about that going on right now. Find the ones that you enjoy and figure out a way that you can promote those. Um, we've done this much with other documentaries in the past where we are, you know, the things that we're passionate about, we um, see films about them. We go out and promote the movies that are already out there. So um, if you don't have the, the resources to make your own film about something, I'm sure there's something out there that is telling you that, that, is, that is sharing your message. And I would highly advocate to to go out and and push that story, push that those films forward. Oh, thank you for that rich answer. Um, that's a terrific answer. Um, thank you, Tom, for the question. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, one quick question about this along the way. Um, uh, what do you make of the work of uh, Adam Curtis, the British documentarian? He um, it, it, well, th this is. This is awful. I'm going to tell you about something to watch, and you'll disappear for like a week just watching this. Um, Curtis uh, uses enough. He doesn't shoot any footage. All he uses are archival footage from mostly the BBC, but also a few other British archives. And he makes documentaries up to six hours long. Yes, and they're fantastic. They're they're detailed political arguments, but yes. but it's in in a sense that's easier in that you don't have to do the full pre-production, you know, shooting, you know, scouting locations or anything. Uh, easier. Easier is definitely, I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> I used to think it's like, it's like people make an animated movie. You don't have to go out there and film it. No, I know, I know. This is, if, if you're, if you're inhabiting that space, I think, if you're, yeah. if you're um, so you've got two questions about the craft of filmmaking, which is, which is terrific. Yeah, that's great. Those are the fun things. I went to school for filmmaking. I went to school at USC, which is not really something to be proud of right now. I don't know if we should be proud of that or not because of all the stuff that's going on. I can still say bye on. I can still say bye on. Um, but, um, well, we have we have more questions that come in text, and I'm just going to read a few of these too. Uh, one that comes up from uh, the excellent Peter Shea is: Was there one practice that filmmakers found that was particularly important to promote student success? Yeah, for us, I think the the thing that we found was targeting. So. so Targeting is the wrong word, but finding students. So um, being aware of the students that you have on the campus and then being aware of what and 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 jumping in to support early and often. Um, and I know this is like something that is so everybody's like, well, of course. Yeah, we have lots of counselors and we have counselors that are. But going in and stepping in um, and being being part of that student's life right away um, from the moment they're accepted all the way until they're graduating. Um, and there's lots of people that are doing it in different ways. And so there's tech spots that are working. Um, Georgia State talks about their their tech spot a lot and like how mm -hmm. all the questions that it can answer and stuff like that. But not just being there to answer questions, but also being there to pose questions, to ask questions, to be um, uh, in these students' lives um, a lot is, is really important. And that is an expensive thing. And this is what we've yeah. we talked to people and they're like, well, that's great. We can, you know, we'd like to boost our counseling or we'd like to boost this, but it's very, very expensive. And that it always comes back to money. Everybody's like, well, it's, it's really expensive. It's really expensive. And that's true. Supporting students and being and adding uh, people and, um, and programs that are going to support these students is going to be expensive. And so that is a, that's a tough thing to find. Um, but that was for, from what we saw along the way, having more one-on-one -on -one and having more um, intervention and stepping in uh, early and often is is always going to to yield a higher graduation rate and more success. Um, that's what they do in high school. You know, that's what they do when they're younger. It's like they have a teacher there. They have the people. They're meeting with them. They know. And in our documentary, we talk about it. It's like if a school is if high school has a graduation rate of 65% or less, then it's marked a dropout factory, 65%. Many, many uh, huge state institutions have graduation rates under 40% and we don't bat an eye at it. And it's, it's you know, down the street from us, there's a state school that had a graduation rate of 27% when we started working on this documentary. I'm not sure what it is now, but I'm like, 
27%. I mean, that's terrible. How do we continue to fund that? How do we continue to, to uh, allow that, that those numbers? Um, and I know that there are tracking issues and people will argue, hey, well, once they leave our school, we can't track them. Well, we need to start changing that. We need to make sure that these students are being successful. Um, so uh, I think that I think that if we don't do something and step one is trying to figure out a way to be in these students' lives from the moment that they get accepted so that you don't have a summer meld where people disappear and don't show up to first day of classes. Mm -hmm. If you follow them all the way through their freshman year, making sure that in a much more highlighted way to make sure that they are um, successful through their freshman year and show up for their sophomore year. And then touching in, touching base with them all the time. That's what's going to yield a higher uh, graduation rate. So, and that's just step one. There are so many other things. That's a, a powerful step. Um, and uh, I want to bring up um, uh, another guest who has a question precisely along those lines. Uh, this is Jacob. Is it Gowell or Gowell? It's Gowell. Gowell. Nice of you to come. Thank you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. So my question is, have you encountered any ideas uh, for improving retention rates that cost exactly nothing? <laughs> Um, I don't think so. Um, I think the idea of costing exactly nothing is, is impossible, right? So well, how, how about in, in dollar terms? Yeah, no, I, I think that the way that it costs exactly nothing is to move things around, right? To allocate mm -hmm. funds in different ways. And so, um, there are, and, and I'm not the expert if we, if we had, you know, someone from Georgia State, if we had Tim Rennick up here, which I would highly recommend getting him on here if you can. Um, so if you had Tim on here, he would, he'd probably be able to tell you more ideas. Um, but the cost of being absolutely zero um, is tough, but there are very small ways of doing it. So one of the things that they, that Georgia State implemented that a lot of other schools are taking over now is what they call the Panther Grant. And it's basically a graduation uh, grant excuse me, and so what it, is, what it is is students that have a need, a financial need at $1,500 or less um, at, uh, and they're on track to graduate, they're a junior or senior, they're on track to graduate, they need $1,500 or less, they, uh, they can give that money without a student having to, um, uh, to do anything. They're not applying for the funds. They have a they have a need that's in their that's in their bank account, basically in their school account, and some of them are as low as six hundred, five hundred dollars. Um, and a lot of those students are actually just not showing up for their last semester because oh. of their last year, even though they're on track to graduate, they have everything they need, and that five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars is stopping them from getting their degree. So that is something that they realized, hey, if we just had a small amount of money, we could do something with this. And so they actually got a very small grant that was given to the school, um, and it started a fund where now that money actually turned, goes to these students, and they don't give away that much to each student, but the, the, the number of people that are graduating from that, from that gap dramatically increased very, very quickly. And now something that Tim will say, which is actually really interesting, is often people think that it's just going to cost money, but the truth is that the return on your investment is greater than the investment itself. So it, the ROI, which is really a tough thing to, to be able to prove, but the ROI on fighting for retention is greater because these students are saying, and they're paying tuition for another year. They are, they're staying at their, uh, in their dorms, doing all these things. So the, the ROI is, is there. And, and I can't point to all the numbers, but every time I sit with Tim and I hear him do his spiel, I'm blown away that the, that the school is not just spending money to make sure these students stick around. They spend money and the students stick around and then it pays for what they've, what they've spent. Um, so I don't think that starting from scratch and saying there's no money, we're not, it's not going to cost us anything, is is going to be um, that easy. But I think that there are lots of ways that you're going to get that money returned um, in the end, and that's just something that you have to fight for. Um, that's a, a great question, um, Jacob. Stick around for a second. If I can just build on this a little bit, two two short questions. One is, do you think 
open education resources, which are either free or very, very low cost. Did you see them playing a role in helping the students succeed? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that open source uh, education is, is great. Uh, the I think the hard thing with a lot of these is one, you have to get the information to the student, and two, you have to have somebody there to maintain that they're actually doing it. So if you don't have some sort of uh, accountability, look, there are plenty of Peter Thiel will, Thiel will tell you to go out there and just you know go online and learn everything you can on YouTube, and then you can start your own business and you can become a billionaire like me. Um, that just doesn't happen, right? It, it, it there's a handful of people that are very, very select that yes, they can sit and learn everything they need to learn online. Um, they have those resources. I also get annoyed where people are like, just go into YouTube. And I'm like, I can't tell you how many people don't have access to YouTube at their home. Like, it's amazing to me like that, that we just assume that like, oh, well, everybody has access to the internet all the time. No. Not true. So, um, so it, but the idea that like, yes, you can just educate yourself. We'll just give, give all the resources. There's everything out there on the internet. You can just learn everything you want and then go off and do that. That's not realistic. To be able to do that, you need to spend tons and tons of time, which means you don't have a job. You know what I mean? You don't have something that's paying your bills. And it also means that um, that you have to have the, the confidence and the ability to just sit and work on something and hope that it's going to pay off in the future. Most people don't have that. And most people aren't going to move in that. And a lot of people that try to do that end up not being successful. Um, and so uh, there is, the, I, in my in my opinion, um, we have to make sure that yes, we can provide free resources and open source resources, but if if we don't have an institution or if we don't have a group that is drawing the student to those resources and making sure that they are following up and turning those resources and the, and the stuff that they learn from that into uh, a career or some sort of, um, you, you know, uh, degree that will help them move on in their future then then it's just information that's expensive to do all that um again our, jacob's question is a fantastic one um let, let me ask one question which is even harder based on jacob's and uh and jacob's gonna regret asking this question now um is is there anything that colleges and universities currently do that doesn't directly contribute to student success that they could stop doing uh, put money to student success? I mean, this can be a radioactive question. How much time do we have? Um, that is, 14 minutes, right? <laughs> that's the question that I like to pose to all of the universities that I talk to. I mm. say, mm. let's look at the things, because lots of universities like to brag on the things that they're doing that are helping students. Oh, there's this and we've got this and we've got that. And all of it's great. And so I like to pose the question, which I actually heard from, um, I forget, another speaker. Uh, and he said, we need to look at the things that we need to stop doing. It's great. Look, at these are all these things that we're doing, but what do we need to stop doing? And there is a, a huge amount of things that we need to stop doing. Um, and I could get into oh, so many of them, but it really depends on the, on the, on the school level. Um, so each school has a different, you know, how much money are you putting towards towards certain things that are not actually serving student success. And my argument is I want everybody to go online, go to your school's website and read what your school mission is. Just hmm. find out like what is your school's mission? Hmm. Right? So everybody's got a mission statement. It could be a sentence, it could be a few paragraphs. What is your mission statement? What is the goal of your school? And then look at every dollar that's being spent. And every time we have board meetings and trustee meetings and we're trying to push money into this and that, let's make sure that it feeds the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, most likely the mission doesn't say something like we really want to move up in the US News and World Report rankings. I'm just sure it doesn't say that. Um, I would be really surprised if it was like, we want to be a higher ranked school. Um, that's just not the, that's not what's important. Most often these missions are going to say things like, we want to be creating graduates. We want to be creating, you know, educated people and sending them out into the world. If we're not doing that, if the mission, if that mission is not being accomplished by the money that's being spent, then let's not spend the money in that way. Um, is this is this decision actually going to grow the amount of graduates? Is it going to grow the amount of, um, uh, of uh, students prepared to go out into the world? Hmm. If it's not 
then let's rethink the way we're spending that money. And so I really do, I challenge everybody to go and look at what the mission is of the schools that you're supporting. What is the mission? And when you support that school, is the, is your dollars and is the work that, that's going to that school actually directly related to that mission? Because unless you're looking at schools that have, you know, 80, 90% graduation, we need right. to think where we're spending that money. That's a fantastic question. Jacob, thank you for showing up on, on the forum and ruining your career. I'm sorry to, uh, <laughs> that's a fantastic, I, I want to bring you to lots of meetings, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we have a few other questions that have been bubbling up and um, um, I, I, I definitely don't want to monopolize this question. Uh, here's one that angles over from the K-12 um, feeding in angle. And this is from the excellent uh, Ed Webb, professor at Dickinson College. Uh, he asks, how are educational institutions, K-12 and higher ed, serving or failing the increasing number of students diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders? And that is out of my wheelhouse. Um, Did you write that know. in your in your making the film? Yeah, I don't I don't know um, much about that type of like that type of special education. Um, unfortunately, I would I, I think if I would start to say something, I'd probably be completely wrong. Um, but that is a very very interesting question, and I think that there are lots of people out there that should be looking into that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. I appreciate your your honesty. Thank you. Uh, and Ed, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I would be happy to grab a, a guest for a future forum to dive into that particular subject, which is a big, important issue, one that's definitely growing. Um, we have um, a, a very practical question from the excellent Roxanne Riskin, who wants to know, are there any li university libraries showing your film? Um, showing our film? Yeah. Uh, so there are there are a lot of universities that have showed the film. Um, we have uh, a long list of schools that have been showing the film in in events, at uh, one-off events. Unfortunately, the film is not yet available for educational distribution. So uh, once we have a theatrical release um, and a, a streaming release, we are going to allow the film to be purchased for libraries and things where the school can own it. Um, but right now, everything, all the events are are licensed are uh, public performance licenses, which basically means you can show the film for an event. Um, and if you want to, this is a, a easy time to plug the film. Um, there's a little button down in the yes, sir. Uh, that's got that's got the uh, the big U from our our uh, um, uh, from our poster. Uh, that should take you to our website. Um, and if you are interested in hosting screening or you want to do an event around the film, uh, you can fill out the form there and that'll get shot over to us and we will be able to full, uh, to, to be able to follow up with that. Um, so you can absolutely show the film. Um, and then, like I said, it's going to be coming out in a little bit um, in September and October um, to a handful of theaters and a handful of cities. And so um, keep an eye out for that, sign up for the newsletter, those types of things, and uh, we'll keep you updated. But then eventually it will be available for uh, educational distribution, and so you'll be able to get it at libraries. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Roxanne, thank you both for the practical question and also for bringing in libraries, uh, always playing an essential role in, in education. Um, friends, we have time for about two more questions. So now is your chance, if you haven't had a chance to ask already. Um, this is this is also the part of the program where we tend to push discussion towards the future if we haven't already done so. And uh, I'd like to ask, just looking ahead, say you know, five or 10 years, um, are there any changes to higher education that you're seeing that we should really be paying attention to if we're interested in helping students succeed? And for example, are, are, are you seeing uh, you know, rising numbers of non-traditional students, i.e. adult learners? Um, are there any rising challenges that we really need to be taking into account that are going to be bigger in the future? I think that, uh, I mean, obviously, the, so much of the conversation, um, I just read this wonderful article um, that was on uh, Third Way uh, about what, what, the, what the true, what people truly care about in, in higher education. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot of talk about uh, uh, free college, and and that kind of thing um but people but the majority of people are actually more concerned about accountability about the the free college movement um and this was a, a study that was done and it's mm -hmm. both left and right republican mm -hmm. and democrat and this uh 
this idea that we need to be, we need to make sure the schools are accountable. And I think that accountable to graduation rates and to a bunch of other things, but I think that that actually kind of points us in the direction of the future of what we do need to look at. Um, and it's exactly one of the things that you said, non-traditional students are higher than ever, uh, that we have so many students out there that have children um, that are that are uh, coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, that are coming from uh, different parts of the of the country that don't necessarily fit into the stereotypical college mold. And so we need to make sure that we are, that institutions are focusing on them more. Um, and then obviously, you know, the money aspect. Everybody's talking about free college. Is that the answer? Is it just making, is making it free the answer? Or is there something that we have to do um, even if it's in conjunction with that, to make sure that the students that get there are finishing. Um, there's a lot of places across the country or across the world that have free college and free community college or, or two-year institutions mm -hmm. um, that don't have great graduation rates either. And so it's not just making it free, it's also making it quality and making sure that we're, that we're um, getting the students to and through. Um, so I think for us, the number one thing that people are talking about, or the number one thing that we should be talking about um, in the future is making sure that we know who the students are today's student you know that they are adult learners that they are and yeah. that, that number is growing every single year more students are going back to school um, everybody agrees even with all the talk about whether a college degree is worth it everybody agrees that a college degree is absolutely worth it and that it's important to move up in the in society uh, so we, we need to make sure that we're educating all of these students, um, and then, and then figuring out the best way to pay for it, which is always the conversation. That really is. I mean, uh, the American strategy now has been to, um, pay for it with debt, uh, with student loans. Um, and I, I guess I should ask that in, in the film, what role did, uh, student loans play in shaping the lives of these five students and were they, did that, did it show up? Was it daunting? Was it empowering? What did you? What do you, how do they come across? Debt is something that is, uh, you know, is a, is a reality. Everybody that you know has to, that can't pay for a college straight out um, is going to go into debt. And what you see in the film is that these students have relatively small amounts of debt, mm -hmm. amount of debt. Um, you know, less than twenty thousand dollars, which twenty thousand dollars is a lot of money for a for a low income student. But twenty thousand uh, dollars of debt, which is still you know, a large number is relatively manageable if you can pay it off at a normal level, if you have a good rate and you have a good job. The, old, the big problem is, let's say it's $20,000 or $10,000 worth of debt, which is a lot of these students, like that giant trillion dollar debt that we hear, yeah. is actually a lot of little tiny pieces. Um, and that is, our big issue is not just the debt, it's the debt without degree. That's that's the problem. Right. If you go, it'd be like going and putting money down on a car, but never getting the car. You don't have the thing that you paid for. So making payments for years. Yeah, making payments for years, and you can't declare bankruptcy. It's it's kind of an awful situation. But the 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 debt without the degree is what we constantly are are pointing at. So it's not just like you know, let's make sure that no students have any debt, because if you have $20,000 worth of debt and you have a BA, that's that's a good turnout because that BA can turn into a much higher level. Uh, and, and everybody knows that number. You should, you, if you don't know it, it it's a million dollars more over your lifetime, right? Students make a million dollars more with a bachelor's degree than they do with a high school graduation over their lifetime on average. That million dollars is a pretty good uh, return on investment if you're spending twenty thousand dollars of debt. Um, that's a pretty good return on investment. Now, if yeah. you get twenty thousand dollars worth of debt and you don't get a degree, then it's a terrible investment. So you, we have to make sure that students are finishing. That's our. That is the whole reason why we come back to this. It's like we don't want to send students away without a degree and having debt. We have to make sure they're finishing. That means the institutions need to change what they're doing to make sure that they're not sending students away with debt without a degree. Make sure they're sending them away with a degree, with right. the power to succeed and go beyond. Um, Adam, I hate to say this, but we are somehow out of time. We have we have reached the uh, the end of the hour, um, carried away by your enthusiasm and by your vision. Um, thank you so much. Let, let me ask one last question before um, before we leave, which is, how do we stay in touch with you? We go to unlikely.com. Yeah, unlikelyfilm.com. 
yeah, yeah. Go check out our website um the, you can follow us on twitter uh i'm i my the the film's twitter is unlikely film uh is at unlikely film uh we have our our production company is three frame media so we have an at three frame media um okay. i've got a one so you can follow me it's just adam fenderson or something like that um but uh I, yeah I, I would say keep up on on social media um and then also through our website we can sign up for our newsletter we don't bombard you with newsletters we just send one out every now and then to kind of keep people posted on what's going on um, so yeah uh, that's terrific. Uh, thank you so much for making this film. Uh, I'm really looking forward to as many people as possible seeing it. And um, I'm really looking forward to your next film as well. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me. Take care. And don't go away, friends. Uh, you've been asking great questions. Um, and I want to point you towards next week because here's what's coming up. Uh, next week, we have uh, a wonderful guest, Joanne Soliday, who has written a new book on a complete vision for a new university. Does it support students towards graduation, as we've been discussing? Let's find out. The book is called Pivot, and we're really looking forward to diving into that. Now, speaking of readings, um, our book club is gearing up for another reading of science fiction to help us imagine the future of science fiction, of education and technology. So please get me your title suggestions, and we'll be putting out a poll for that very soon. If you'd like to grab a copy of Pivot or any of these other books, head to our bookstore, the only bookstore in the future of education out there. And if you'd like to keep this conversation going, thinking about what Georgia Tech did, thinking about what Westchester did, thinking about this film, we have plenty of venues for that. We have groups on Slack, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can follow me on Twitter as people have been talking today. And if you'd like to uh, keep our conversation going, you know how to do it. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for your time. Take care. Bye-bye.